Chapter 51 Mind Over Metal Where did you find that? demanded Ronan as Aragon staggered into the atrium of her house and dropped the lump of bright steel ore onto the ground by her feet. In as few words as possible, Aragon explained about Solombum and the Minoa tree. Squatting next to the ore, Runin caressed the pitted surface, her fingers lingering over the metallic patches interspersed among the stone. You were either very foolish or very brave to test the Minoa tree as you did. She is not one to trifle with. Is there enough ore for a sword? Sephira asked. Several swords, if past experience is anything to judge by, said Runin, rising to her full height. The elf woman glanced at her forge in the center of the atrium, then clapped her hands together, her eyes lighting up with a combination of eagerness and determination. Let us do it, then. You need a sword, Shade Slayer. Very well. I shall give you a sword, the likes of which has never been seen before in Allegasia. But what of your oath? Aragon asked. Think not of it for the time being. When must the two of you return to the Varden? We should have left the day we arrived, said Aragon. Runin paused, her expression introspective. Then I shall have to hurry that which I do not normally hurry, and use magic to craft that which would otherwise take weeks of work by hand. You and Brightscales will help me. It was not a question, but Aragon nodded in agreement. We shall not rest tonight, but I promise you, Shade Slayer, you shall have your sword by tomorrow morning. Bending at the knees, Runin lifted the oar from the ground without discernible effort and carried it to the bench with her carving in process. Aragon removed his tunic and shirt so he would not ruin them during the work to come, and in their place Runin gave him a tight-fitting jerkin and a fabric a apron treated so that it was, a it was impervious to fire. Runin wore the same. When Aragon asked her about gloves, she laughed and shook her head. Only a clumsy smith uses gloves. Then Runin led him to a low, grotto-like chamber set within the trunk of one of the trees out of which her house was grown. Inside the chamber were bags of charcoal and loose piles of whitish clay bricks. By means of a spell, Aragon and Runin lifted several hundred bricks and carried them outside, next to the open-walled forge, and then did the same with the bags of charcoal, each of which was as large as a man. Once the supplies were arranged to Runin's satisfaction, she and Aragon built a smelter for the ore. The smelter was a complex structure, and Runin refused to use much magic to construct it, so the project took them most of the afternoon. First, they dug a rectangular pit five feet deep, which they filled with layers of sand, gravel, clay, charcoal, and ash, and in which they embedded a number of chambers and channels to wick away moisture that would otherwise dampen the heat of the smelting fire. When the contents of the pit were level with the ground, they assembled a trough of bricks on top of the layers below, using water and unfired clay as their mortar. Ducking inside her house, Runin returned with a pair of bellows, which they attached to holes at the base of the trough. They broke then to drink and to eat a few bites of bread and cheese. After the brief repast, Runin placed a handful of small branches in the trough, lit them on fire with a murmured word, and, when the flames were well set, laid medium-sized pieces of seasoned oak along the bottom. For nearly an hour, she tended the fire, cultivating it with the care of a gardener growing roses, until the wood had burned down to an even bed of coals. Then Runin nodded to Aragon and said, Now! Aragon lifted the lump of ore and gently lowered it into the trough. When the heat on his fingers became unbearable, he released the ore and jumped back as a fountain of sparks swirled upward like a swarm of fireflies. On top of the ore and the coals, he shoveled a thick blanket of charcoal as fuel for the fire. Aragon brushed the charcoal dust from his palms, then grasped the handles of one set of bellows and began to pump it, as did Rune in the bellows on the other side of the smelter. Between them, they supplied the fire with a steady stream of fresh air so that it burned even hotter. The scales on Saphira's chest, as well as on the underside of her head and neck, sparkled with dazzling flashes of light as the flames in the smelter danced. She crouched several yards away, her eyes fixed upon the molten heart of the fire. "'I could help with this, you know,' she said. "'It would take me but a minute to melt the ore.' "'Yes,' said Ronan. "'But if we melt it too quickly, "'the metal will not combine with the charcoal "'and become hard and flexible enough for a sword. "'Save your fire, dragon. "'We shall need it later.'
The heat from the smelter and the effort of pumping the bellows soon had Aragon covered in a sheen of sweat. His bare arms shone in the light from the fire. Every now and then, he or Runin would abandon their bellows to shovel a new layer of charcoal over the fire. The work was monotonous, and as a result, Aragon soon lost track of the time. The constant roar of the fire, the feel of the bellows handle in his hands, the whoosh of the rushing air, and Saphir's vigilant presence were the only things he was aware of. It came as a surprise to him, then, when Runin said, "'That should be sufficient. Leave the bellows.' Wiping his brow, Aragon helped as she shoveled the incandescent coals out of the smelter and into a barrel filled with water. The coals sizzled and emitted an acrid smell as they struck the liquid. When they finally exposed the glowing pool of white-hot metal at the bottom of the trough, the slag and other impurities having run off during the process, Runin covered the metal with an inch of fine white ash, then leaned her shovel against the side of the smelter and went to sit on the bench by her forge. "'What now?' Aragon asked as he joined her. "'Now we wait. For what?' Runin gestured toward the sky, where the light from the setting sun painted a tattered array of clouds, red and purple and gold. "'It must be dark when we work the metal, if we are to correctly judge its color. Also, the bright steel needs time to cool, so that it will be soft and easy to shape.' Reaching around behind her head, Runin undid the cord that held back her hair then gathered up her hair again and retied the cord. "'In the meantime, let us talk about your sword. How do you fight, with one hand or two? Aragon thought for a minute, then said, "'It varies. If I have a choice, I prefer to wield a sword with one hand and carry a shield with my other. However, circumstances have not always been favorable for me, and I often have to fight without a shield. Then I like being able to grip the hilt with both hands.' so I can deliver a more powerful stroke. The pommel in Zorak was large enough to grasp with my left hand if I had to, but the ridges around the ruby were uncomfortable, and they did not afford me a secure hold. It would be nice to have a slightly longer hilt. I take it you do not want a true two-handed sword? said Runin. Aragon shook his head. No, it would be too big for fighting indoors. That depends upon the size of the hilt and the blade combined. But in general, you are correct. Would you be amenable to a hand-and-a-half sword instead? An image flashed in Aragon's mind of Murtag's original sword, and he smiled. Why not? thought Aragon. Yes, a hand-and-a-half sword would be perfect, I think. And how long would you like the blade? No longer than Zorak's. Hmm. Do you want a straight blade or a curved blade? Straight. Have you any preferences as to the guard? Not especially. Crossing her arms, Runa sat with her chin touching her breastbone, her eyes heavy-lidded, her lips twitched. What of the width of the blade? Remember, no matter how narrow it is, the sword shall not break. Perhaps it could be a little wider at the guard than Zorak was. Why? I think it might look better. A harsh, cracked laugh broke from Runin's throat. But how would that improve the use of the sword? Embarrassed, Aragon shifted on the bench, at a loss for words. Never ask me to alter a weapon merely in order to improve its appearance, admonished Runin. A weapon is a tool, and if it is beautiful, then it is beautiful because it is useful. A sword that could not fulfill its function would be ugly to my eyes, no matter how fair its shape not even if it were adorned with the finest jewels and the most intricate engraving. The elf woman pursed her lips, pushing them out as she thought. So, a sword equally suited for the unrestrained bloodshed of the battlefield, as it is for defending yourself in the narrow tunnels under Farthendur. A sword for all occasions, of middling length, but for the hilt, which should be longer than average. A sword for killing Galbatorix, said Aragon. Runa nodded. And as such, it must be well protected against magic. Her chin sank to her chest again. Armor has improved a great deal in the past century, so the tip will need to be narrower than I used to make them, the better to pierce plate and mail, and to slip into the gaps between the various pieces. <sighs> From a pouch by her side, Runin withdrew a knotted piece of twine 
with which she took numerous measurements of Aragon's hands and arms. Afterward, she retrieved a wrought iron poker from the forge and tossed it toward Aragon. He caught it with one hand and raised an eyebrow at the elf woman. She motioned toward him with a finger and said, Go on now, up on your feet, and let me see how you move with a sword. Walking out from under the roof of the open-walled forge, Aragon obliged her by demonstrating several of the forms Brahm had taught him. After a minute, he heard the clink of metal on stone, then rune and coughed and said, Oh, this is hopeless. She stepped in front of Aragon, holding a, another poker. Her brow furrowed with a fierce scowl as she raised the poker before her in a salute and shouted, Have at you, Jade Slayer! Runin's heavy poker whistled through the air as she swung at him with a strong, slashing blow. Dancing to the side, Aragon parried the attack. The poker jumped in his hand as the two rods of metal collided. For a brief while, he and Runin sparred. Although it was obvious she had not practiced her swordsmanship for some time, Aragon still found her a formidable opponent. At last they were forced to stop, because the soft iron of the pokers had bent until the rods were as crooked as the branches of a yew tree. Runin collected Aragon's poker, then carried the two mangled pieces of metal over to a pile of broken tools. When she returned, the elf woman lifted her chin and said, "'Now I know exactly what shape your sword should be.' "'But how will you make it?' A twinkle of amusement appeared in Runin's eyes. "'I won't. You shall make the sword instead of me, Shade's lair.' Aragon gaped at her for a moment, then sputtered and said, "'Me?' But I was never apprenticed to a blacksmith or a bladesmith. I have not the skill to forge even a common brush knife. The twinkle in Runin's eyes brightened. Nevertheless, you shall be the one to make this sword. But how? Will you stand beside me and give me orders as I hammer the metal? Hardly, said Runin. No, I shall guide your actions from within your mind, so that your hands may do what mine cannot. It is not a perfect solution but I can think of no other means of evading my oath that will also allow me to ply my craft. Aragon frowned. If you move my hands for me, how is it any different from making the sword yourself? Runin's expression darkened, and in a brusque voice, she said, Do you want this sword or not, Shade Slayer? I do. Then refrain from pestering me with such questions. Making the sword through you is different because I think it is different. If I believed otherwise, then my oath would prevent me from participating in the process. So, unless you wish to return to the Varden empty-handed, you would be wise to remain silent on the subject. Yes, Rune and Elda. They went to the smelter then, and Rune and had Sephira pry the still warm mass of congealed bright steel from the bottom of the brick trough. Break it into fist-sized pieces, Rune and directed, and withdrew to a safe distance. Lifting her front leg, Saphir stamped upon this rippled beam of bright steel with all her strength. The earth shook, and the bright steel cracked in several places. Three more times, Saphir stamped upon the metal before Runin was satisfied with the results. The elf woman gathered up the sharp lumps of metal in her apron and carried them to a low table next to her forge. There, she sorted the metal according to its hardness, which, or so she told Aragon, she was able to determine by the color and texture of the fractured metal. Some is too hard, and some is too soft, she said, and while I could remedy that if I wanted to, it would require another heating. So we will only use the pieces that are already suitable for a sword. On the edges of the sword will go a slightly harder steel. She touched a cluster of pieces that had a brilliant, sparkling grain. The better to take a keen edge. The middle of the sword shall be made of a slightly softer steel. She touched a cluster of pieces that were grayer and not so bright. The better to bend and to absorb the shock of a blow. Before the metal can be forged into shape, though, it must be worked to rid it of the remaining impurities. How is that done? asked Sephira. That you shall see momentarily. Runin went to one of the poles that supported the roof of the forge, sat with her back against it, crossed her legs, and closed her eyes, her face still and composed. "'Are you ready, Shade Slayer?' she asked. "'I am,' said Aragon, despite the tension gathered in his belly. The first thing Aragon noticed about Runin, as their minds met, was the low chords that echoed through the dark and tangled landscape of her thoughts. 
The music was slow and deliberate, and cast in a strange and unsettling key that scraped on his nerves. What it implied about Runin's character, Aragon was not sure, but the eerie melody caused him to reconsider the wisdom of allowing her to control his flesh. But then he thought of Sephira sitting next to the forge, watching over him, and his trepidation receded, and he lowered the last of the defenses around his consciousness. It felt to Aragon like a piece of raw wool sliding over his skin as Runin enveloped his mind with hers, insinuating herself into the most private areas of his being. He shivered at the contact and almost withdrew from it, but then Runin's rough voice sounded within his skull. Relax, Shade Slayer, and all shall be well. Yes, Runin, Elda. Then Runin began to lift his arms, shift his legs, roll his head, and otherwise experiment with the abilities of his body. Strange as it was for Aragon to feel his head and limbs move without his direction, it was stranger still when his eyes began to flick from place to place, seemingly of their own accord. The sensation of helplessness kindled a burst of sudden panic within Aragon. When Runin walked him forward and his foot struck the corner of the forge, and it seemed as if he were going to fall, Aragon immediately reasserted command over his faculties and grabbed the horn of Runin's anvil to steady himself. "'Do not interfere!' snapped Runin. If your nerve fails you at the wrong moment during the forging, you could cause yourself irreparable harm. So could you if you're not careful, Aragon retorted. Be patient, sage slayer. I shall have mastered this by the time it is dark. While they waited for the last of the light to fade from the velvet sky, Runin prepared the forge and practiced wielding various tools. Her initial clumsiness with Aragon's body soon disappeared although once she reached for a hammer and rammed the tips of his fingers into the top of a table. The pain made Aragon's eyes water. Runin apologized and said, "'Your arms are longer than mine.' A few minutes later, when they were about to begin, she commented, "'It is fortunate you have the speed and strength of an elf, Shade's Lair, else we would have no hope of finishing this tonight.' Taking the pieces of hard and soft bright steel she had decided to use, Runin placed them into the forge. At the elf's request, Sephira heated the steel, opening her jaws only a fraction of an inch so that the blue and white flames that poured from her mouth remained focused in a narrow stream and did not spill over into the rest of the workshop. The roaring pillar of fire illuminated the entire atrium with a fierce blue light and made Sephira's scales sparkle and flash with blinding brilliance. Runin had Aragon remove the bright steel from the torrent of flames with a pair of tongs once the metal began to glow cherry red. She laid it on her anvil, and with a series of quick blows from a sledgehammer, flattened the lumps of metal into plates that were no more than a quarter of an inch thick. The surface of the red-hot steel glittered with incandescent motes. As she finished with each plate, Runin dropped it into a nearby trough of brine. Having flattened all of the bright steel, Runin pulled the plates out of the trough, the brine warm against Aragon's arm and scoured each plate with a piece of sandstone to remove the black scales that had formed on the surface of the metal. The scouring exposed the crystalline structure of the metal, which Runin examined with great attentiveness. She further sorted the metal by relative hardness and purity according to the qualities the crystals displayed. Aragon was privy to Runin's every thought and feeling by reason of their closeness. The depth of her knowledge amazed him. She saw things within the metal he had not suspected existed and the calculations she made concerning his treatment were beyond his understanding. He also sensed she was dissatisfied with how she had handled the sledgehammer while flattening the steel. Runin's dissatisfaction continued to grow until she said, Bah! Look at those dents in the metal! I cannot forge a blade like this! My control over your arms and hands is not fine enough to craft a sword worthy of note! Before Aragon could attempt to reason with her, Sephira said, The tools do not the artist make, Runanelda. Surely you can find a way to compensate for this inconvenience. Inconvenience, snorted Runan. I have no more coordination than a fledgling. I am a stranger in a stranger's house. Still grumbling, she subsided into mental deliberations that were incomprehensible to Aragon, then said, Well, I may have a solution, but I warn you, I shall not continue if I am unable to maintain my usual level of craftsmanship. She did not explain the solution to either Aragon or Sephira, but one by one placed the plates of steel on the anvil 
and cracked them into flakes no wider than rose petals. Gathering up half the flakes of the harder bright steel, Runin stacked them into a brick, which she then coated with clay and birch bark to hold them together. The brick went onto a thick steel paddle with a seven-foot-long handle, similar to those used by bakers to insert and remove loaves of bread from a hot oven. Rune had laid the end of the paddle in the center of the forge, and then backed Aragon as far away as she could, and still have him hold on to the handle. Then she asked Sephira to resume breathing fire, and again the atrium glowed with a flickering blue radiance. The heat was so intense, Aragon felt as if his exposed skin were crisping, and he saw that the granite stones of which the forge was made had acquired a bright yellow glow. The bright steel could have easily taken over half an hour to re reach the appropriate temperature in a charcoal fire, but it required only a few minutes in the withering inferno of Saphir's flames before it turned white. The moment it did, Runin ordered Saphir to cease breathing fire. Darkness engulfed the forge as Saphir closed her jaws. Rushing Aragon forward, Runin had him transport the glowing brick of clay-covered steel to the anvil, where she seized a hammer and welded the disparate flakes of bright steel into a co cohesive hole. She continued to pound on the metal, elongating it out into a bar, then made a cut in the middle, folded the metal back on itself, and welded the two pieces together. The bell-like peals of ringing metal echoed off the ancient trees that surrounded the atrium. Runin had Aragon return the bright steel to the forge once its color had faded from white to yellow, and again Sephira bathed the metal with the fire from her belly. Six times Runin heated and folded the bright steel, and each time the metal became smoother and more flexible, until it could bend without tearing. As Aragon hammered the steel, his every action dictated by Runin, the elf woman began to sing, both with his tongue and her own. Together, their voices formed a not unpleasant harmony that rose and fell with the beats of the hammer. A tingle crawled down Aragon's spine as he felt Runin channel a steady flow of energy into the words they were mouthing, and he realized that the song contained spells of making, shaping, and binding. With their voices, too, Runin sang of the metal that lay on the anvil, describing its properties, altering them in ways that exceeded Aragon's understanding, and imbuing the bright steel with a complex web of enchantments designed to give it strength and resilience beyond that of any ordinary metal. Of Aragon's hammer arm, Runin also sang, and under the gentle influence of her crooning, every blow she struck with his arm landed upon its intended target. Runin quenched the bar of bright steel after the sixth and final fold was complete. She repeated the entire process with the other half of the hard bright steel, forging an identical bar to the first. Then she gathered up the fragments of the softer steel, which she folded and welded ten times before forming it into a short, heavy wedge. Next, Runin had Saphira reheat the two bars of harder steel. Runin lay the shining rods side by side on her anvil, grasped both of them at either end with a pair of tongs, and then twisted the rods around each other seven times. Sparks shot into the air as she hammered upon the twists to weld them into a single piece of metal. The resulting mass of bright steel Runin folded, welded, and pounded back out to length another six times. When she was pleased with the quality of the metal, Runin flattened the bright steel into a thick rectangular sheet, cut the sheet in half lengthwise with a sharp chisel, and bent each of the two halves down the middle, so they were in the shape of long, shallow Vs. And all that, Aragon estimated, Runin was able to accomplish within the course of an hour and a half. He marveled at her speed, even though it was his own body that carried out the tasks. Never before had he seen a smith shape metal with such ease, what would have taken horse to hours took her only minutes. And yet, no matter how demanding the forging was, Runin continued to sing, weaving a fabric of spells within the bright steel and guiding Aragon's arm with infallible accuracy. Amid the frenzy of noise, fire, sparks, and exertion, Aragon thought he glimpsed, as Runin raked his eyes across the forge, a trio of slender figures standing by the edge of the atrium. Saphira confirmed his suspicion a moment later when she said, Aragon, we are not alone. Who are they? he asked. Saphir sent him an image of the short, wizened weircat Maud, in human form, standing between two pale elves who were no taller than she. One of the elves was male, the other female, and they were both extraordinarily beautiful, even by the standards of the elves. 
Their solemn, teardrop faces seemed wise and innocent in equal measure, which made it impossible for Aragon to judge their age. Their skin displayed a faint, silvery sheen, as if the two elves were so filled with energy it was seeping out of their very flesh. Aragon queried R Runin as to the identity of the elves when she paused to allow his body a brief rest. Runin glanced at them, affording him a slightly better view. Then, without interrupting her song, she said with her thoughts, "'They are Alana and Dusan, the only elf children in Elismira. There is much rejoicing when they were conceived twelve years ago.' "'They are like no other elves I have met,' he said. "'Our children are special, Shade Slayer. They are blessed with certain gifts, gifts of grace and gifts of power, which no grown elf can hope to match. As we age, our blossom withers somewhat, although the magic of our early years never completely abandons us.' Runin wasted no more time talking. She had Aragon place the wedge of bright steel between the two V-shaped strips and hammer on them until the strips nearly enveloped the wedge and friction held the three pieces together. Then Runin welded the pieces into a hole, and while the metal was still hot, she began to draw it out and form a rough blank of the sword. The soft wedge became the spine of the blade, while the two harder strips became the sides, edges, and point. Once the blank was nearly as long as a finished sword, the work slowed as Runin returned to the tang and carefully hammered her way up the blade, establishing the final angles and proportions. Runin had Saphira heat the blade in segments of no more than six or seven inches at a time, which Runin arranged by holding the blade over one of Saphira's nostrils, through which Saphira would release a single jet of fire. A host of writhing shadows fled toward the perimeter of the atrium every time the fire sprang into existence. Aragon watched with amazement as his hands transformed the crude lump of metal into an elegant instrument of war. With every blow, the outline of the blade became clearer, as if the bright steel wanted to become a sword and was eager to assume the shape Runin desired. At last, the forging came to a close, and there on the anvil lay a long black blade, which, although it was still rough and incomplete, already radiated a sense of deadly purpose. Runin allowed Aragon's tired arms to rest while the blade cooled by air. Then she had Aragon take the blade to another corner of her workshop, where she had arranged six different grinding wheels, and on a small bench, a wide assortment of files, scrapers, and abrasive stones. She fixed the blade between two blocks of wood and spent the next hour planing the sides of the sword with a draw knife as well as refining the contours of the, of the blade with files. As with the hammering, every stroke of the draw knife and every scrape of a file seemed to have twice the effect it normally would. It was as if the tools knew exactly how much steel to remove and would remove no more. When she was done filing, Runin built a charcoal fire in her forge, and while she waited for the fire to mature, she mixed a slurry of dark, fine-grained clay, ash, powdered pumice, and crystallized juniper sap. She painted the blade with a concoction, slathering twice as much as the spine as she did along the edges and by the point. The thicker the solution of clay, the slower the underlying metal would cool when it was quenched, and as a result, the softer that area of the sword would be. The clay lightened as Rune and dried it with a quick incantation. At the direction of the elf woman, Aragon went to the forge. He lay the sword flat upon the bed of scintillating coals, and pumping the bellows with his free hand, slowly pulled it toward his hip. Once the tip of the blade came free of the fire, Runin turned it over and repeated the sequence. She continued to draw the blade through the coals until both edges had acquired an even orange tone, and the spine of the sword was bright red in color. Then, with a single smooth motion, Runin lifted the sword from the coals, swept the glowing bar of steel through the air, and plunged it into the trough of water next to the forge. An explosive cloud of steam erupted from the surface of the water, which hissed and sizzled and bubbled around the blade. After a minute, the roiling water subsided, and Runin withdrew the now pearl-gray sword. Returning it to the fire, she brought the whole sword to the same low heat, so as to reduce the brittleness of the edges, and then quenched it once more. Aragon had expected Runin to relinquish her hold on his body after they had forged, hardened, and tempered the blade but to his surprise, she remained in his mind and continued to control his limbs. Runin had him douse the forge 
Then she walked Aragon back to the bench with the files and scrapers and abrasive stones. There she sat him, and making use of ever finer stones, she polished the blade. From her memories, Aragon learned that she would normally spend a week or more polishing a blade. But because of the song they sang, she, through him, was able to complete the task in a mere four hours, in addition to carving a narrow groove down the middle of each side of the blade. As the bright steel grew smoother, the true beauty of the metal was revealed. Within it, Aragon could see a shimmering, cable-like pattern, every line of which marked the transition between two layers of the vel velvety steel and along each edge of the sword was a rippling, silvery-white band as wide as his thumb, which made it appear as if the edges burned with tongues of frozen fire. The muscles in Aragon's right arm gave way as Runin was covering the tang with decorative cross-hatching, and the file he was holding slipped off the tang and fell from his fingers. The extent of his exhaustion surprised him, for he had been concentrating upon the sword to the exclusion of all else. Enough, Runin said and she removed herself from Aragon's mind without further ado. Shocked by her sudden absence, Aragon swayed on his seat and nearly lost his balance before he regained control over his rebellious limbs. But we're not finished, he protested, turning toward Runin. The night sounded unnaturally quiet to him without the strains of their extended duet. Runin rose from where she had been sitting cross-legged against the pole and shook her head. I have no more need of you, Shade's Lair. Go and dream until dawn. But you are tired, and even with my magic, you are liable to ruin the sword if you continue to work on it. Now that the blade is done, I can attend to the rest without interference from my oath. So go. You will find a bed on the second floor of my house. If you are hungry, there is food in the pantry. Aragon hesitated, reluctant to leave, then nodded and shambled away from the bench, his feet dragging in the dirt. As he passed her, he ran a hand over Saphir's wing and bade her good night, too weary to say any more. In return, she tousled his hair with a warm puff of air and said, I shall watch and remember for you, little one. Aragon paused on the threshold of Runin's house and looked across the shadowy atrium to where Maud and the two elf children were still standing. He raised a hand in greeting, and Maud smiled at him, bearing her sharp, pointed teeth. A tingle crawled down Aragon's neck as the elf children gazed at him. Their large, slanted eyes were slightly luminous in the gloom. When they made no other motion, he ducked his head and hurried inside, eager to lie down upon a soft mattress 